Hello, Achim Yekirim. Shavu Atov. Shavu Amevorach. Hope you had an amazing Shabbat. I uh, wanted to go over some alachot that are very necessary for all of Am Yisrael, especially the ones that are doing tshuva right now, as well as anyone that's uh, in the process of converting or recently converted but has not yet uh, koshered their kitchen. Uh, so there's a few things that we need to understand when it comes to koshering a kitchen. First and foremost, why is it so important to even kosher a kitchen? When Hashem talks to us in the Torah about eating non-kosher food, He specifically tells us that when we eat non-kosher food, we become tameh, we become impure. And He uses the word venitmetem, and you've become impurified. And the sages explain to us that if you... Uh, that same word could also be said as netamtem. Netamtem means stupefied, meaning we become spiritually stupid. Uh, not stupid in a sense that we can't build buildings and pick stocks and, you know, uh, handle a uh, math uh, equation, but rather spiritually stupid in a sense that it's very, very difficult for us to learn Torah and actually connect to it. So someone that is trying to do the will of Hashem and is trying to connect to Hashem and build their emunah, build their, their yirah, their fear of Hashem, and build their, their connection to Hashem, ultimate connection with Hashem, must eat kosher. Now this is specifically talking to Jewish people or someone that's already in the process of converting. If someone is a Noahide, they're not obligated by the kosher laws. If they want to comply with them, they can, but it doesn't change their neshama the same, to the same extent as it does a uh, Jew. Because a Jew is obligated by it, whereas a non-Jew is not obligated by it. Although I would recommend everyone eat kosher because in general, it's also healthier. Now as far as koshering a kitchen... There are a few things that we need to understand is that in general there are certain things, certain uh, metals that, uh, and, and things of that nature that we could actually kosher even if they were used for non-kosher products. But there are also certain things that we cannot kosher. For example, clay or uh, ceramic cannot be koshered. If you've ever used a ceramic uh, bowl of some kind uh, for non-kosher food, it cannot be koshered. You have to throw it out. But with, in regards to metal, metal actually has these pores, these microscopic pores, which the, uh, the pot or the pan actually swallows some of the, um, or absorb is a better word, absorb some of the actual uh, juices and flavors of the non-kosher meat and non-kosher products. So those things have to be uh, corrected or in essence koshered. So the way to do it in uh, regards to uh, the uh, spoons, knives, and uh, uh, forks, as well as pots that were used to, uh, to make uh, some you know, wet food, meaning stews and things with water in them, they have to go through something called an agala. Agala means that it's, a, uh, it's someone that's a professional, it's uh, usually an uh, orthodox Jew that knows what they're doing, that's an ex- expert in this field. They actually take a very, very large pot that could practically fit every other pot in it uh, and put extremely hot, extremely boiling water uh, in there. And they actually, you know, they're constantly under fire. They put these uh, pots and the forks and knives into this extremely boiling water, which opens up these uh, pores and releases any of this non-kosher uh, that was actually in it. This is the process that has to be done for anything that used that was uh, used to eat non-kosher products, whether it's meat or anything hot and things of that nature. Now, when it comes to pans, pans are usually things that use oil, but not water in them, and it's uh, it's actually um, has to go through a process called libun. Libun is under fire, where that same usually that same person would take a blowtorch and actually put the fire through all of the different parts of the pen uh, to make sure to open up the pores and burn any of the residue, any of the actual uh, chemicals or uh, juices that that pan absorbed from the non-kosher meat or non-kosher product that was in it. Um, Now, many of the pans today also have a Teflon uh, on top of the pan, which usually gets destroyed with this fire, which means that most likely the pan will not survive, it will not be the same, so you'd actually have to buy a new pan. But Baruch Hashem, today the uh, prices for pots and pans 
are drastically cheaper because uh, obviously it's much easier to make than it used to be. Uh, also, this applies to anyone that wants to use the, you know, the same pots and pans for, that are expensive for Pesach, for Passover. They also would have to either do this agala or this libun in order to uh, make their pots and pans kosher for Pesach. Uh, in regards to um, uh, cups, if the uh, cups were actually uh, only used for, um, you know, for just liquid and not for food, you don't have to do anything. If it was just for, you know, juices and, uh, uh, and drinks of that nature, you don't have to kosher them under any of these libun or, uh, um, uh, or agala. Uh, in regards to uh, the microwave, microwave, you have to put a uh, cup First, you have to obviously stop using it for 24 hours. Then you put a cup with a uh, cleaning product, usually a um, baking soda, in there uh, for and put it on for 20 minutes, and then not use it again for another or so uh, another day or so. Uh, absolutely, under no condition should you put bleach in there because it's very very dangerous. So uh, it's baking soda is usually the best. You put baking soda uh, in a cup, uh, you know, with uh, water inside the actual um, microwave now to uh, the uh, the oven you have to uh, put it under one of those uh, self if it has a self-cleaning button then obviously put that uh, but in general uh, it's also good to uh, put also a um, uh, some type of uh, a baking soda or something like that for for 30 minutes in the oven uh, this is also very good in regards to the oven to cleaning the oven uh, all of the uh, glass, 100% glass plates uh, or cups or anything that's glass does not need to go through an agala for Sephardics. If, you're, if you follow Sephardic law, you do not need to do an agala uh, because the, uh, technically glass does not swallow, does not have pores. But the Ashkenazim do need to uh, do an agala for, uh, for glass uh, you know, plates and, uh, and so on. So they need to go to an agala. Uh, this is just one of the chumot that the Ashkenazim have, which is a stringency that the Ashkenazis have to be more careful, which I applaud them for. Uh, it's very good to be a machmir on certain things, especially something as simple as co- and as important as kosher in a kitchen. Um, as I said, the uh, cups do not need to do anything uh, unless they are, uh, if they're... Um, if they're ceramic and you've uh, have used them for things that are non-kosher, you cannot kosher them. So if it was used for, I don't know, some type of uh, soup for your cup or anything like that for, uh, you know, in one of the cups, then you cannot use it. Um, let's see. And uh, fridge, the refrigerator has to be uh, just cleaned very, very well uh, and uh, just really, really clean. Make sure all the food comes out. Obviously, make sure that all of your... Uh, non-kosher food is out of the house everything that's in your house has to have a kosher sign on it whether it's juice or it's meat obviously or it's milk or it's anything everything has to have a kosher sign on it. the only things that do not need a kosher signs on them are things that are obvious like fruits and vegetables because those grow naturally and do not need a kosher stamp on them but generally everything else needs to be kosher there's a reason if something doesn't have a kosher sign on it there's a reason for it for example just about uh, six or seven years ago uh, a company by the name of sunny delight that made orange juice uh, finally got a kosher sign now for years people would ask themselves how come this orange juice company doesn't have a kosher sign is this the rabbis are making stringencies they're making it difficult for them they're making it uh, they're trying to milk them for money no they didn't what happened what people didn't know is that one of the ingredients in Sunny Delight, the orange juice, uh, was called a weird name. It was called like a code. And what that, what that actual ingredient was, was an ingredient that Sunny Delight Orange Juice Company realized makes the orange juice more yellow. And they wanted to make it more marketable. They wanted to look better than other orange juices. So therefore, they used this ingredient. What is this ingredient? Crushed beetles. Yes, beetles. Yes, the bug. The bug that you know people run away from or at least shoo away. Yes, that's what they used in order to make their orange juice more yellow. So if something in today's world where it's relatively simple to get a kosher symbol on your products, 
If something doesn't have a kosher sign on it, there is a reason. And it's definitely not the rabbis. It's just that companies, especially in the Western world today, use disgusting ingredients uh, for a lot of products be, that are cheap and also disgusting. And if you only knew what's in some of this non-kosher food, trust me when I tell you that even if you don't want to keep kosher, you'd still not want to eat those products uh, once you know what they are. We actually, about, Baruch Hashem, about almost a year and a half ago, published a list of all these uh, foods, all of these ingredients that you'd find in every single one of these non-kosher products. And uh, many people... Uh, you know, get really strong with uh, with kosher after they read this list because, again, like I said, even if you care less about kosher, the reality of it is that most rational people, most people that are civilized would not want to eat these ingredients that you find in non-kosher products. Uh, moving on, when it comes to the uh, counter, the countertop of the kitchen, uh, many people have a marble countertop. And what you do is you pour boiling water a little bit at a time and clean it you know boiling water will open up any pores that there are in the marble uh, uh, top you clean it up and that's it it's very very simple to uh, clean the countertop um you see and i think we covered uh everything that uh you basically need to do for koshering a, a kitchen again most important part is to kosher what we eat which is to have kosher food now, one of the main things we need to know about kosher is obviously Hashem talks about the uh, alakha of not being allowed to eat meat and milk together. Now, there's three, it's mentioned three times in the Torah that we're not allowed to uh, eat milk and meat. So the Chazal sages ask, why the same exact verse in the Torah three times? Nothing is extra in the Torah. So there's three separate violations with milk and meat. We're not allowed to eat it. We're not allowed to cook it, meaning you're not allowed to actually work at a McDonald's, even if you don't eat the food. This is one of many reasons why you're not allowed to eat at a non, uh, work at a non-kosher place or run, chas v'shalom, a non-kosher place. Uh, you're not allowed to eat it, obviously. And last but not least, you're not allowed to enjoy it, meaning that even if, let's say, for example, you made yourself a perfectly healthy burger, kosher burger, perfectly kosher burger and by mistake a little bit of cheese you know a cheese fell on top of it and it cooked together you're not even allowed to give that burger that cheeseburger now to your dog why because if you give your cheeseburger to your dog you will technically enjoy it because you would then not have to give him dog food and therefore you would benefit out of a milk and meat which you're not allowed to do so this is the reason why there's three times in the Torah mentioned the uh, the isul, the uh, prohibition of eating milk and meat. But there's a few other things, uh, chidush, that you want to hear about the halacha of milk and meat. Is that there's also something called a um, a cancellation of one out of sixty, where, uh, for example, if there is two distinct tastes, the milk and the meat are two distinct tastes, obviously. If, let's say, for example, you have a uh, pot of milk, a big, large pot of milk, and a 60th, 1 60th of a size of meat falls into the pot. Then, because of this bitul, because of this specific clause, you're allowed to take that piece out of the kosher milk and then, you know, throw it out or clean, you know, wash it off. And then the milk remains kosher. Why? Because there are two distinct tastes, two completely separate tastes. And it's obvious that the uh, the milk, since it's 60 times more, you have 60 times more milk than the meat, then it's obvious that the uh, taste, the overwhelming taste would be milk and not meat. But on the other hand, if there is uh, one drop of non-kosher milk, just one drop of non-kosher milk, let's say... uh, milk coming from a non-kosher animal, dropping into a huge, giant canister of milk. It could be a thousand times larger. A thousand times larger of kosher milk. But you have only one tiny little drop of non-kosher milk going into 
that large canister of kosher milk, the entire canister is now not kosher. And the reason why is because the, uh, the tastes are not distinct, meaning that you will not be able to tell the difference between the two, and therefore the whole thing becomes non-kosher. This is an halakha we need to know for this last story that I want to tell you. Chazal tells us that in Genesis 27, chapter 27, verse 34 to 38, when Esav finds out that Yaakov, his brother, stole his blessing from the father Yitzchak, he screamed, screamed, says he screamed, and he shed three tears. One in his right eye, one in his left eye, and one actually went back inside. Now Chazal says that when he cried, he actually cried genuinely because he lost his own future interest. Like he actually had a genuine cry where he realized that my future destiny has been changed because of this. And he actually became what's called a mekatreg, which is a prosecutor against Am Yisrael. That's why it says, Alakha, according to the Midrash, Alakha, Esav sonet Yaakov. Esav hates Yaakov. So he became a prosecutor against Am Yisrael, where every time Am Yisrael made any sins, he would go, his, his uh, malach, his angel would come to, um, to, to Hashem and say, look, according to your Torah, they're sinning. And these two tears, listen to this, these two tears, first one caused the destruction of the first Bet HaMikdash, and the second one was one of the uh, things that actually led to the destruction of the second Bet HaMikdash. So Chazal then asks, they're like, wait a minute, but then there's this Bitul we just learned about, where if, you know, if we have two distinct tastes, if, you know, if we have uh, two, two distinct tastes where, you know, he, his, his uh, whole issue is that he went against Am Yisrael because he uh, lost his blessing. But if we have, even if it's Esav, some, you know, someone that was, you know, historically significant, he cried, okay, fine. But uh, we would think that more Jews have cried throughout the years than just these two tears. And this is where Chazal says, to cry genuinely for the Bet HaMikdash, for the loss of the Bet HaMikdash, to the same level as what Esav did for it, losing his own interest, we haven't done enough. So this gives us a little bit of an understanding of what we need to do when we're mourning in Tisha B'Av that's coming up, when we're mourning, when we do the Vidui every day, when we say sorry to Hashem, we need to think about not just our own personal interest, like Esav, but rather the interest of Hashem. Because if we think about the interest of Hashem, then it's one out of 60. If we only think about our own interest like Esav, even a thousandfold will not be enough. Chazakim Buchim, thank you for learning Torah with me, and may Hashem continue to bless you. Kol Tuv.